Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about quantitative finance projects here. I'm going to talk about this and kind of mention both doing this as a student and as a practitioner. Um, the approach, the method, the reasoning should all be the exact same here, but let's just dive on in. So for students, often you have a resume, you have some sort of education section, you might have an internship, and you've got a bunch of blank space and you're trying to fill it. Now, you wanna fill this in a few different ways. One, you wanna fill it so your resume just doesn't look awful and empty like you've never done anything. And two, you want to get that job and show you have some sort of expertise here. Now, the absolute worst thing you can do, and I have looked at hundreds, if not thousands, probably 20, I don't know, 10, 20,000 resumes over the years, over a decade here, do not fill your resume with nonsensical, easy, copy-paste projects here. And I made this statement recently at a few different universities, and students have been very shocked because this is the advice they're getting, and I'm telling them to do the opposite here. Um, don't do something that can be defined as a statement. I you know, modeled Black Shoals with Python. I modeled Black Shoals with Excel. Um, I priced stock with this model. I did this. It's a statement. You didn't do any sort of quantitative finance. You didn't do anything interesting. You didn't struggle with a problem. Um, I'm not gonna ask about it because it's a waste of space and a waste of talent and time and resources. Um, don't put nonsensical, easy, cheap projects on your resume. And I've been telling people this, you're just filling the resume to fill the resume. Um, and I'm gonna let you on a big secret here in a second on why quant finance is dying out in itself as an industry, at least this is what I'm coming to. Um, and it's because it's really hard to do and hard to do correctly. For practitioners though as well, often you can fill gaps and spaces um, if you're wanting to pivot. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you wanna get into quantitative finance, you're already working in the industry in one spot, you wanna to get to another spot, build a project to get into that new spot here, that different spot that you want to get into. AI is a huge area here where a lot of people are saying, hey, I want to get into AI for finance, I wanna do machine learning research, more on the LLM side or even just general automation side of this. I wanna get over there, how do I do that? create some sort of awesome project, really struggle with it, really build it out um, and get to that point here. So the point of this and doing the research, I'm gonna give you guys some examples here so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, everybody knows like the, you know, here's the John C. Holes um, options, futures and other derivatives. This is fine. It's a baby introductory book to quantitative finance. It does some hand waviness. It pulls a few models out of the, off the shelf here, the black shawls and boxes, and it puts them out and says, this is quant finance. The reality is most quants that are doing actual modeling research, um, struggling with quantitative problems, aren't just pulling a model off the shelf and fitting some sort of historic data to estimate some parameters in a model that's already built here. We're doing model development or we're doing quantitative research or a bunch of different names for this. We're doing actual quantitative work to come up with some sort of solution, prediction, um, and decision here for a business here. So what you should do instead of doing these overly simple projects, and I'll give you examples here. Um, Dimitri, I did portfolio optimization with mean variance or Markowitz. Great. Like you did this. So the first question in my head is why does it suck? And why does it never work? And how would you implement it properly? And students are often staring at me like a deer in the headlights. They have no idea what to do here. The other ones are like, I did Monte Carlo simulation for a bunch of stocks and I predicted the, the path of the stock. Okay, like what's interesting about this? Let me give you guys some alternative ideas to these so you can kind of see what I'm getting at here. Um, let's start with the portfolio optimization. So you say, I do mean variance portfolio optimization or you picked a method. What I've been encouraging students and practitioners on is one, if you do a project on something like portfolio optimization, why does it work and why does it not work? There's no silver bullet. There's no easy solution. Quant finance isn't this thing where you just go through the motions, you do the five steps and you're done. If you did, we would just automate it with AI and we'd all just move on. It's much, much harder on this. So if you do portfolio optimization, go look at other methods, compare and contrast them. That's a much more interesting research paper and project that you're not gonna learn in school that's gonna show value on a resume here to give you a few ideas on this. Um, there are a variety of different methods besides mean variance, but you could also do something like uh, inverse reinforcement learning. So there is a textbook uh, on machine learning and finance, and I've mentioned this a million times. Uh, Igor Halpern wrote a section on here on in, in for reinforcement learning or inverse reinforcement learning in here, different applications, different problems. Anyways, um, I love this book. I just had him on the podcast as well. I'll put a link in the description below and probably a card or something above if you're interested in looking, just learning about his journey and his life. Uh, again, 
Get something more interesting. Get something new. This is one idea. The other idea would be doing something like NNS. So non-linear, non-parametric statistics, which Fred Viola has been doing. It's part of all the labs. I've been on the fringes, interested, somewhat involved with. Um, he has an approach for using NNS um, to do this. Why not do something new, exciting, research? Like, dig deep and find something new and exciting to do with this because when I interview you, I don't want to see that you've done the same old nonsensical thing over and over and over again because the reality is in the industry, we're not just doing the same cookie cutter black box thing. And if you are, you're not doing quantitative finance. You're just doing generic finance and you're just struggling with it and you probably have a bunch of issues and you don't know where to start or where to begin on here. So those are kind of some ideas on that. The other thing that's been driving me nuts when people say, Dimitri, I did Monte Carlo simulation and I did this little dinky project on here. And I'm like, I mean, like, like tell me more. Like, what, what did you do on the Monte Carlo? What distribution did you use? How did you get to the data? And again, they're like a deer in the headlights. So like, what do you mean? I just did Monte Carlo. And I'm like, all right. So like there are, there's a book. There's all these books. Uh, this is Monte Carlo Methods in Financial Engineering. This is like Glasserman. This is the book University of Michigan uses, if you're curious. So if you took, you know, Monte Carlo and you did it in like a week or two weeks in your class in your financial engineering program or whatever, um, there's a lot more to this than just setting up and sampling data from historical data, which is what I see most students doing. And then they think they're doing Monte Carlo simulation. Like, yeah, you kind of are, but like, why does it work? How does it work? What's the issues? Um, did you try different approaches? Like, there's stuff to dig into and to read and to make these projects interesting. Um, the other part of this too with portfolio optimization and all these different things, I always ask people like, why does it not work? What's the main issue that we're facing here? And they don't know. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a hint here. There's a book, I do not recommend this book. This is a graduate level mathematics book. I think it is very, very hard to digest someone who's outside of the field, including myself. Hard book to, to grasp here. Um, this one's ergodic theory with a view towards number theory. This one's by N. Sedler and Ward. Um, again, but ergodic theory and stationarity has been a huge piece of time series and financial modeling. It is a crux of many problems. I'll throw that out there. That is something to look at. Just go get a book, like an interesting textbook on something new and exciting that's not quantitative finance focused um, on, you know, these are the five easy steps to do some ridiculous project, but nobody does it this way in the industry. The other piece here I'm going to throw out here is like on this note of just getting interesting books. This is an old book I bought. This is Time Series Analysis, Forecasting and Control by Box and Jenkins. Um, if you're curious, there's the Box Jenkins methods for doing time series. I'm not saying follow this book and do this and magically your projects will work stellar. Go get a book, go get a paper. I'm gonna list some papers below here. I'll list off a few. Again, of the two authors I mentioned as well, I'll list more in the description as below. Agus Sugianto used to be the head of model risk management over at Wells Fargo. He has some interesting papers. I'll link some of his stuff below. Um, Igor Halpern, as I mentioned, has a paper recently that just came out on September 19th um, titled Nonlinear and Metastable Dynamics in Financial Markets, Evidence from High Frequency Cryptocurrency Market Makers. This is interesting. This is new. Like, go read this um, and do a project around this then. Like, go find something exciting to read. Um, the other paper I'm going to mention here is Deriving Nonlinear Correlation Coefficients from Partial Moments um, by Fred Viole uh, and David Naraki. Again, I'm not saying these are great ideas. I'm not saying everybody should go do this project. What I'm saying is to get a really good project, it should not be done in a few weeks. If you can do a project in a few weeks and you can say, I did A, B, and C, and you check the box and you made your resume better, it's gonna be an awful resume and an awful project. You guys, people that make really good quants are interesting, excited, they dig deep and they learn. Um, I've got all these textbooks and things, and I know I don't have a lot of money when I was a student, I only had a few textbooks, but I would get an interesting textbook, like I'd buy some old crusty textbook, I don't know, just get a, get a textbook that interests you on a topic and dive deep into it and figure out how you can apply that to quantitative finance. And more importantly, as you're going through any sort of project here, ask yourself, is it working? Why is it working? Why is it not working? And how can I make this better? If you can answer those in a project, you will have a much better project. If you do a project and you're like, I did the project, you failed. You didn't learn anything. You didn't do anything exciting. You're not cutting edge and changing how things are done. 
Quantitative finance is very hard. People, dynamics, relationships, statistics, and data are all moving around us in this crazy global world, and we're trying to understand parts and pieces of it to make financial decisions, to move the economy, the businesses, um, you know, consumer credit, all kinds of areas, investing, wealth management forward. But to do that, you need a lot of interesting and unique tools to understand the world around us. That is what quantitative finance is, and I'm getting very frustrated with so many just garbage, trash, easy projects that are not dynamic and interesting. And please do not ask me for a project. I cannot determine what your interests, your desires are, your educational background. You might not be qualified to go after specific types of projects, but you might be really qualified to research some other sort of areas. So find something interesting related to quantitative finance, or maybe it's a little bit on the fringes of it. Maybe it's not quite related, but dig deep and really, really get into the nuanced details and issues. And one final point here, as I've mentioned to one student who left off the only valid project they had on a resume, they failed at it. And many, many students, many practitioners fail at projects and they don't put them on the resume. Show me your research process. Show me your insights. What did you learn from this? Did it fail? How did it fail? Why did it fail? Where did you get stuck? Again, get into the nitty gritty excitement of quantitative finance and math and stats and everything in programming and bring all this together. That is what projects should do on the resume. It should be this really exciting point to talk about. It shouldn't be like, oh, I've done these projects and every other student has the same boring, stupid projects that as a hiring manager, I am sick of looking at because I know it has no value because that's not how we're doing things in practice. So anyways, I hope you guys find this helpful. Go find something exciting. Look in the description below for more references, links, ideas, start to get things moving. Go find something fun and exciting to work on. Um, stop working on the cookie cutter project. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.